and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the coordinator of the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. Co-hosting with me today is Holly Campbell, Extension Associate with the Southern Regional Extension Program. Today we're excited to have our guest speakers, Justice Jones with the Austin, Texas Fire Department and Mike Wharton with the Austin Clark County, Georgia Recreation Leisure Program. Justice and Mike will be giving two presentations today on their efforts to get prescribed fire on the ground in areas nestled right up to urban zones. I'd like to take just a moment and share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. Our program is a regional program for fire science delivery in the southeast. We're a collaborative between University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station, and NC State University. And we're part of a very successful nationwide network of fire science exchanges that are, that are hosted by the Joint Fire Science Program. As a network, we, we exist to increase the availability and application of fire science for natural resource managers and to serve as a conduit for fire managers to then share their information and science needs with folks in the science community. And it's now my pleasure to hand things over to, to Holly to introduce our speakers today. Hello, everyone. Um, Again, my name is Holly Campbell, and I really appreciate all of you joining our webinar. I'm an Extension Associate with the Southern Regional Extension Forestry. As our name implies, we're part of the Cooperative Extension Service and focus on forestry and natural resources, education, outreach, and IT support across the Southern Region. Two program areas I've had the great pleasure of working on at, at the organization I work at are wildland and fire and urban forestry. I work closely with the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy in the Southern Region and on a cooperative extension project in urban forestry called Trees for Energy Conservation. This webinar is in direct support of and by these projects. So I kind of wanted to take us to a 30,000 foot level of why we're having this webinar. Uh, with increased urbanization across the world and the known benefits of urban trees and forests, coupled with increased wildland urban face, wildland urban interface issues and the need for fire resilient landscapes and communities, this webinar could not be more timely. On a personal level, many parts of Georgia, um, if we have any folks from Georgia here, um, have had no rain for over two months. And we've got wildfire threats across Georgia and I know across many areas of the country as well. So prescribed fire is shown to reduce the threat of wildfire, maintain critical landscapes, and be in an effective forest management tool. But what if we apply these same benefits to urban land management? During this webinar, our two speakers will share the steps and tools they use to successfully utilize prescribed fire in an urban setting, discussing the benefits, outreach, education, planning tools, and technology necessary to make prescribed fire use at the wildland urban interface possible. So um, we have a little switch up on our speakers today. So our first speaker is going to be Mike Wharton. Mike is the Operation Administrator at the athens Clark County Leisure Services in Georgia. Mike's knowledge and experience as a forester, his 30 plus years experience in parks and recreation management, and his great patience and enthusiasm have led him to develop a unique city forest management project based on restoration and education. Our second speaker is Justice Jones, um, who is the Wildfire Mitigation Division Program Manager with the Austin, Texas Fire Department. Um, Justice has, over the past 15 years, um, integrated his knowledge and experience as a forester, fuels coordinator, and the Texas State Wildland Urban Interface Coordinator to address the current WUI challenges that are occurring in Austin, Travis County. So I want to thanks, uh, thank you to Southern Fire Exchange for hosting this webinar. We're really excited about it and all the folks who have joined. And I would say let's get started with Mike. My portion of the speech is uh, concerning a prescribed fire in an urban setting. This is a case study in Athens, Georgia. The project is made possible by a grant from the nonprofit support group, Sandy Creek Nature Center Incorporated. A little bit about the uh, background about Georgia's forest. The state is 67% of the state is forest land. Of the 67%, 90% of the forest landowners own $200, 200 acres or less. This has some pretty significant management implications and this was an important consideration as we move forward with our demonstration forest concept. In 2015, the Georgia Forestry Commission sent out a landowner survey and found that timber production was one of the top three priorities for forest landowners who had a thousand or more acres. So obviously there were a lot of other reasons why people own forest land. And 
our project needed to take that into account. The small landowner, the urban-faced landowner, those were important considerations in our project. We combined urbanization, the thought of urbanization, we looked at the creation of these smaller and smaller parcels as, as urban areas develop. And as those parcels become smaller, the idea of managing land tends to decrease as well. So we have less and less land actually being actively managed. So we knew that if we were going to get a new strategy, we were going to have to reach out to people who owned everything from a quarter acre to hundreds of acres in this urban wildland interface. Athens is located in the northeast Georgia Piedmont region. It's the smallest of 159 counties in the state. Yes, we have a lot of counties in Georgia. We're only beat by, by Texas. There are over 120,000 residents in Athens and another almost 35,000 students attending the University of Georgia. The Athens property, 40% uh, of our land base is tax exempt. From a fire perspective and historical uh, context, the fire return interval for the Piedmont region where Athens is located was approximately every five years. So we took that into account in our planning process. If you spend any time in the southern woodlands, you'll quickly realize how much the southern forest is under siege. Invasive species, forest ecosystems that have been disrupted or stressed, management declining on the small, especially on these small urban lots. There, this also applies to state agencies and particularly to local government agencies. The very agencies who usually are the largest single landowner in a community of these local governments. And interestingly enough, although Georgia is a leading state in prescribed fire, fire remains excluded from many parts of the state. We knew that if we were going to be part of the solution, we needed to be able to integrate professional land management regimes and methods into general operations. We really needed to develop a model and a success story, and one that included prescribed fire. Sandy Creek Nature Center was the ideal site to pick for a demonstration forest. Over the years, it had lost significant amount of biodiversity through succession. We had poor wildlife habitat, extremely poor forest health. The center is also an environmental and natural science education facility. It's open to the public, so it's accessible. So people have, can get to the project, can see what's happening. It is actively providing environmental education and interpretive uh, programs and services. It's already working with the public, with students, college students, uh, students K through 12, uh, groups, civic groups, and others, and volunteers. So they have the infrastructure already in place. Staff and volunteers had also spent a couple of decades developing the concept and then completing the projects involving interpretive exhibits. The center in 2013 completed the indoor component of five interactive learning centers, one of which was the Woodland Interactive Learning Center. The concept behind each one of these five learning centers was to have an indoor and an outdoor component. We knew that you could tell a story richly and a much more diverse story if we could combine the two ideas together. Things you can teach indoors, you can't teach outdoors, and vice versa. And that's where the Managed Forest comes in. The Managed Forest Project is the outdoor portion of this exhibit. One of the questions we, we started asking and we started off with was, if we're going to be able to use prescribed fire, what are the challenges that we think we might face? So we started with them again working through what are potentially people's misconceptions about prescribed fire. Everybody has seen on the news countless times what happens out west. There's this perception that fire destroys everything. You're going to have this huge fireball in the sky. It's going to kill all the wildlife. The woods will look terrible. People will be complaining. And worst of all, we're going to look really bad. And that, was, that, that is a common thing that we ran into. Yet we knew that this is what the fire would really look like under a prescribed fire regime. So we knew that we had a lot of education to do. <clears throat> We also knew that to be successful in the long term, we would really have to make prescribed fire a normal part of what we do. Indeed, it needed to be viewed as business as usual, not an emergency, not an incident. We did encounter some hesitancy in this area as we move forward, especially with our emergency management staff. They were they had not ever encountered a prescribed fire. This actually was going to be the first time our government set its own property on fire on purpose. So there was this hesitancy of what's going to happen, what, how will this work? I will have to, to praise the folks we work with. There was a lot of respect given to us as we move forward with this process. We also had some severe uh, challenges on the site. If you look, you can see that on the eastern side of our property, 
There's a four-lane state highway, lots of uh, how residential housing. The southern part of our property is bordered by a four-lane divided highway, a bypass. Again, a lot of urban uh, in, intrusion into the, into the forest. You have housing, you have businesses. The other part that was a challenge is we needed either a south wind, wind coming from the south, or east wind. Our prevailing wind patterns in Athens are north, are, are from the north and from the west. So it's going exactly the wrong direction. The other challenge for us is we're located within two miles of the urban core. All of a sudden I have echo. So the Sandy Creek Nature Center is loaded on the, located on the northern part of the county. As you can see, we're 1.9 miles away from the urban center. This is our city hall. Just a few blocks away is the main UGA North campus. And so as you can see in between, lots of uh, urban interface, lots of voters, lots of people that we would have to be working with. So we knew that in this process, here we go. We knew we'd have to build a broad, uh, involve a broad range of people. We'd have to build trust. We'd have to create coalitions and partnerships. And we needed to have a very clear message, and one that was based on solid science. We had to get it right. If we didn't, it would probably be decades before we could attempt it again. The one thing about government is if you try something and it fails um, spectacularly, it's probably going to be a long time before you get to do it again. So if we wanted to have fire uh, among the other tools in our toolbox, we would need a solid plan. So that's why we developed the Managed Forest Project. We conducted the research, uh, developed the management goals and strategies, and located the preferred site. The project consists of approximately 40 acres. It's not a big site. Uh, approximately 40 acres and includes five different management regimes. The, we have a Piedmont Prairie currently. It's about a half acre. It's located right here on the site. Uh, this is the northern part of the 225-acre Sandy Creek Nature Center site. We want to expand that out to be an entire acre, if not a little bit more, providing that wonderful interface and that, that transition between our built environment here with our education center right here, Sandy Creek Nature Center's education building, and the woodlands that come outside of that range. As you see in the dark gray and the gray or brownish colored uh, area, that's going to be a pine forest that's managed using ecological uh, forest management techniques. We're looking at trying to hit a target of 50 square feet basal area in that area with a 90 square foot uh, peak. When we hit up around that, we'll pull it back down to about 50. Underneath, we'll get that herbaceous layer that we're looking for. Uh, the main driving force in this particular uh, method is going to be keeping fire on the ground throughout the cycle. This is a little bit of an experiment for us. Uh, this works really well in coastal plains, but we have uh, loblolly pine in, in this area is our primary uh, tree species. And it doesn't do as well in the seedling stage as it does down the coastal plain with longleaf. We're going to see if this works, if we can't control it, well, how we set the fire, where we set the fire, uh, maybe even scratching out some places around certain uh, where we want some uh, regeneration to occur. So we'll see how this one works. The great thing about the way we're approaching it is if it doesn't, we take fire off the system for it's eight or nine years, and boom, we're in business again. We're going to have a traditional clear cut in this area and a replant. So you'll get to see that contrast between the native, the natural seed stock and uh, the planted improved pines. This is a perfectly legitimate uh, management technique. It meets best management practices. So we feel like we could demonstrate this as one of the alternatives that landowners can use in their properties. The fourth method is in our hardwood management area. Uh, this is a regeneration area. We know we're going to have to go in and plant our high quality uh, oak species and some other wildlife foods underneath. The, the, over, the technical name for this is crop tree management with an oak shelter wood burn harvest technique. So we have to reestablish our high quality habitat before we can actually start managing our hardwoods. This is not unusual in the south. Typically, uh, people either don't manage their property at all, which means it's totally invaded, or they go in and high grade the property, removing the great timber, the really good production timber off the track, which of course typically is the wildlife food as well. The fifth of our management areas is going to be the managed buffer. We will be providing, uh, doing the same, using the same techniques in that area to manage it. 
for that focus of this of the managed buffer area is to buffer up against and, and provide that transition for our visitors. So it, it gives them a chance to experience the forest before they get into the project itself. We have two other smaller initiatives that we're working on. At this point, we're bringing some uh, light resistant chestnut, American chestnut, back into the forest. We'll plant some, see if we can't get some reforestation going using those particular species, and see if that can be successful with magnificent eastern tree that's, that's gone from the sites now. We're trying to bring that back. We're also working on some pollinator initiatives along our roadsides, which are um, our roadsides and our area of the utilities right of ways. In those particular areas, if we can use a harrowing or a light plow method and uh, use that to control a woody vegetation, we'll bring back the uh, herbaceous plants and the pollinators. And we can then take that same finding and, and transfer that out to our government-wide uh, utility areas and possibly roadsides so in particular locations and enhance that, cut fuel costs, cut mowing costs, and really enhance the habitat of the community at large. So when we, we had the plan in hand, we started also pulling people in and involving them. We, we included a broad range of people to help with the drafting and review. We included industrial industry personnel, professional foresters, volunteers, members of the nonprofit board, members of the public who just had an interest in the project. We tried to include a lot of people to put a lot of eyes on this plan so that when we went before our elected officials, which was the next step with that final draft in hand, we wanted it to be solid. We wanted it to be well thought out and, and ready for prime time, so to speak. Uh, when you go before, get your plans ready to go, this is often the way that people view the process. We saw it instead as a real opportunity to share a vision and the importance of prescribed fire and land management. And through this process of sharing that, we really found that we got a tremendous amount of support and enthusiasm coming back. Uh, so that was really made us feel great. So we moved forward from there, all ready to go. And with the blessing of our elected officials, we pushed hard to get the word out. We did it through publications and websites, FAQs, news releases. We met with groups. We talked to visitors. Everything we could do to get the word out and tell people, here's what's going to happen. Come watch. Come see. Come participate. We also took advantage of the Nature Center site itself as a way to let people know. So we gave them an opportunity through these signs. They would learn about it. They would see what was happening in the woods. Or they would get curious. So that way they could come up and see the posters and the handouts and the displays and, and learn more and ask lots of great questions. We knew we needed to get moving as spring came into being. We weren't quite ready to start the harvest. Um, so suddenly I jumped. We knew that the, the spring was coming. We needed to get, and we wanted to have a fast start. We knew we wanted to get some, some, something out very quickly, something that would show people that the project was moving and show some really early success in the effort. So we focused on removing our invasive species. Uh, this is pretty a very typical southern forest, uh, certainly what we dealt with. You can see our workday getting started here and what we were up against. This is the chainsaw that I was working with. This is pretty much what we would cut our way through every time we started this process. And then at the end of the day, this is what the site would look like. We had to do some things on the site that normally you wouldn't do in a, in a, tim a typical timber operation. We went through and we uh, uh, hashed things down. We cut them down to the ground, especially around our trail areas. Uh, we had to consider aesthetics as we moved through the process on a, as a constant uh, concern, making sure that people felt like they could see things in a good way. The whole time we did that, we also worked through the process with our, uh, we kept our signs going so people would see the invasive species coming down, but they wouldn't ask, just go off curious, they would be able to see actually what we were doing as we were doing it. So at the same time, simultaneous to removing the invasive species, we were working on building the coalition. We created our draft burn plan, established the units, and built our fire breaks. We also reached out to a lot of different agencies. It took us about six months. The first person we reached out was Shan Kamek with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. She had been working with us on a half acre prairie burn for the past eight years, and she was fantastic. Helping give us, she helped give us advice, and she generously agreed to help us with the effort. 
Uh, we continue to reach out to other state, local, and federal agencies, and I will tell you every single time along the way we got a lot of positive feedback and support. I'd like to take a quick moment to say thank you to our police and uh, fire department in particular and emergency service folks. They had never done a fire before, and they still gave us a lot of support and faith and belief and, and really encouraged us to keep going, so they were great. We did add a drone component to the effort. We felt like that would provide a significant perspective and a benefit both from a management standpoint and a public relations standpoint. So we created a pre-burn, burn, and post-burn task list and assignment list along with a burn day duty station and activity list. So we had a group of people who knew what they needed to do, where they needed to be, what kind of equipment, material, what trails to shut down. All of that was listed out and we practiced through that. We made sure to include lunch because and refreshments. If you feed people, they will come. So that was an uh, integral part of what we tried to do, is also accommodate people and what they would need. And as we waited for the fire season, this fire time to come, we had, I kept sending out periodic work, uh, up weather updates to the burn team. This became a real important thing. Uh, I actually thought I was wearing everybody out, but by the end of, the, of this time, we had a lot of people on our list, including elected officials and administrators, and, it, and while it seemed like there was constantly coming out, it always kept the fire as a possible thing. So it kept that awareness of, of a fire coming. Of, so when it really was going to happen, it wasn't a big deal. It was like, oh, well, finally it's here. And I, that was a, a real important part that I hadn't expected. So it was a great thing to have, uh, to, to have included. It was one of those accidental serendipity things. So after all of this, we continued to work on invasive species removal, and we waited for perfect weather. It was only five months in the waiting, but it finally came. The weather conditions we were looking for had historically occurred only 2% of the time in the recorded history. Uh, everyone, but it was fantastic. Everybody came together. Uh, what began as a loose network became a complete operation. People were contacted, media released, volunteers came, everybody took their stations. We were underway complete with live Twitter feeds and live Facebook feeds to the day. The equipment came on site. You see we had quite a bit of it. And it was there not only, of course, as a show, but uh, it, it was a way to communicate with the people who were coming. We had a school group visiting that morning. People were on the site as a, uh, the entire time. We had tried to keep it as a normal course of business, and that was our focus. So people were able to have from a safe place with the right kind of uh, restrictions in place they were able to see the fire in progress, experience in a very personal way, talk to the firefighters as they walked back and forth, see the equipment and talk to the operators, and it became a very personal event for them. Our drones were in action. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, this is, the, um, this is the command center. We had live streaming occurring the entire time. Our drone operators were able to show where the fire lines were and how they looked, where the fire was progressing, how it looked what the volunteers were doing, what the fire, wild and firefighters were doing. So the drones were an integral part, and we had that direct feed the entire time the fire was, was going. We could see immediately, and this was huge, what, how was the fire behaving? And it was a perspective that you don't know, normally have. This was a vital part of the effort, and it was a direct feedback to our incident command team, and that was critical. And as you can see in the distance, there's City Hall in downtown. It's visible and right there for us. We could see that that fire went the direction it was supposed to. It was fantastic. The smoke cooperated, the winds cooperated, and at the end of the day, the, when the fire was over, we had absolutely no complaints. The most, it kind of got capped off for us when as we're closing down, it's dark, we're all getting ready to leave, we contained the fire, we were ready to go. A, a visitor came and stopped by in a car, rolled windows down and said, what are you guys doing? He said, well, we just set a prescribed fire. And he looked up and said, thank goodness, that's wonderful. It's about time. It's great. Thank you guys for doing that. It couldn't have been capped off in a better way. I want to again recognize the 19 agencies, state, federal, and local, and the 60 volunteers. They did a great service for the forest, but equally they did a great service to the community in showing that this is a viable um, land management tool. Just to give you an idea of how it worked, here's the day after the burn, one month and then four months. What was fascinating is to see people come in two and three weeks and a couple of months afterwards who would ask us about the fire that happened a long time ago. It really recovered so quickly that there, unless, except in certain places, you wouldn't have even known that we had a fire in some of the places that we were, that were there. 
We still have a few more things to come. We've got the harvesting. We're going to be applying some of these same techniques uh, of communication. So we have harvesting, cutting, thinning, regeneration, uh, planting the chestnuts, working on the pollinator initiative. We've also established permanent vegetative study plots to facilitate some long-term re uh, research efforts with the University of Georgia close by that, that seem natural. And I would encourage anyone, you probably have a community college. They probably have a biology or ecology or forestry unit that they're working in. Reach out to them. They will be glad to help you. We continue to, uh, while we're preparing for the harvest, we continue to enjoy the community benefits. I encourage you, if you're not currently managing your property, I strongly encourage you to start, start small. Just start with what you can. And you'll find, if you reach out, there's a lot of help available and many, many willing hands. There's a lot of other resources that you can have available. These appear, again, at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, the top one is the Control Burn at Sandy Creek. It's 12 minutes with some very cool original music from some of our local musicians. Uh, it, it's a great YouTube video to watch. It's got about six or seven minutes worth of drone video in there. And with that, I will say thank you for your time and turn it over to David again. See, we have a few folks typing in. Uh, Mike, since since we're waiting uh, to see if anybody else had questions, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a few things uh, that, that I noticed when you were talking. And you, you briefly covered that you guys had a drone on the fire. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's, and you mentioned uh, that you were using it to to provide kind of a, a continual heads up as to what's going on on the fire. Could you talk about, you know, how did you find the, the folks who had the drones? How were they integrated into the project? And uh, and and did the picture that they provided uh, really offer some, some real-time information? Was it really valuable for your program, other than putting together a, a great video after the fact? It was, it was really uh, very, very important important to the project. We felt like the way that it got started is a gentleman named Tommy Jordan who was with the geospatial lab at the University of Georgia and I had worked together on some other projects. He is a, a musician, a folk musician uh, extraordinaire and he would come out to our park with a, with a folk music and dance society here in Athens and I got to know him and w I went to a conference and we sat in the same room by each other when the Stephen F. Foster folks came and introduced the concept of drones for urban fire, urban tree management, where you take the drone up, assess the tree for the arborist, and come back down. And we use that. It, we just looked at each other and said, got to get it, got to get it. And so he bought a drone, and we test flew it a few times, seeing the potential in the fire. It does provide some outstanding feedback. You see where your smoke's going. You literally can fly over the fire line, your fire breaks. You can see those pretty clearly, especially in the winter with your leaf off situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step, and if anybody has additional information, the next step that we're looking into is actually seeing if we can link some uh, thermal imaging on the drone. Uh, our Georgia uh, DNR folks have transponders on their outfits when they're out in the fire situation. We want to see if we can't have a, uh, create an opportunity to have the drones flying over with thermal imaging at the same time we're seeing the feed from the transponders and be able to overlay those so you can see where your firefighters are and you can see the thermal image of the fire as it's going past uh, where they're pulling it. It may work really well in leaf, on, leaf off positions. We're not certain how it will work in leaf on. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of playing around with that concept. If anybody has feedback, we'd love to hear it. That sounds fascinating. If you figure it out, you come back and we'll do a webinar just talking about how you guys figured that out. So we, we had some questions that came in. Uh, Tracy uh, asked, says, I'm wondering what advice you have for convincing fire department who, he's, who sees their role as suppression exclusively uh, to get them involved in prescribed burns. So how do you, how do you make the pitch? Well, we... We involved them very, very early in the process. Once the plan was approved with the idea of the prescribed fire being a, a part of the system, I uh, reached out to the, to the fire chief. Uh, I met with their command group, did a whole presentation, offered to actually have and had uh, some of our wildland firefighters, Shan Kamek was willing to come in and talk to our firefighters, Georgia Forestry Commission uh, was willing to come in and talk to our firefighters, our, our uh, regular firefighters, then by reaching out and really 
working with that group. And, and frankly, I had a very receptive uh, fire captain, uh, the fire chief. He was he was really supportive, even though he he was, had never done it. He was. curious. Uh, so it, we, by involving them right up in the front of the process, I really think that made a difference. We did work through several conversations about how do we keep this as not an incident. We didn't want it to be seen why and, and how we used it as an education. Because there was such a huge education component to what we were doing in this community uh, outreach effort, uh, that really intrigued the fire chief as well. So I think it's a combination of having somebody who was receptive and at least willing to give us the benefit of the doubt, and then mm -hmm. really bringing them in very, very early in the process. So we had another question come in from uh, Langford. He says, you know, we, we've used mechanical disc-mounted mowers to treat areas that have been close to homes and roadways with good success. Uh, have you guys used this method uh, when prescribed fire is too risky? So I kind of expand that to your project area as well. Did you guys have some areas on your site uh, where you had to do some mechanical uh, treatments uh, to, to reduce fuel? Were, were you uh, either prior to burning? I saw you did some, some fuel work by hand. Did you use mechanical treatments in there? Are there other areas on your sites where, where mechanical treatments will, will probably be the only way to manage that? Absolutely. We have benefited the U.S. Forest Service Research Experiment Station has actually two, set up two study sites on the 225-acre uh, nature center site. They were looking specifically at privet control. Uh, it was, they took out five acres, one with the mechanical uh, glyphosate treatment and another by hand. And then they spent eight years looking at the results and the changes that happened. So we already had that as reference points. It can be successful. Uh, Part of what we, why we want to expand out with our pollinator project is to be able to test out harrowing as once you remove that really intense, very thick vegetation, can we maintain it using a harrow or light plow method to control the woody plants. So absolutely, you can do mechanical control with success uh, if fire is too risky. Uh, so we wanted to be able to put fire as a tool, but we also absolutely have to depend on the mechanical method as well. So we uh, we have another question in from Tracy, and she's asking if uh, either speaker, and I'm I'm not sure if Justice is back on, um, had to go through a risk risk mitigation review process uh, before doing your burn. Do you have a risk management part, plan? We part of what we have our emergency management uh, staff. Uh, we had a lot of discussions with them, and looking at that, that's where our burn plan came in. Uh, by having a burn plan, looking at the, the maps we had created, we had uh, not only our fire breaks identified, we had escape routes, we had secondary fire breaks identified. And by pulling together our emergency management people with our Georgia Forestry Commission and their plow and our DNR folks who looked at it, that was how we kind of worked our way through it. I can't emphasize enough how that collaboration of getting people who know how to do things with people who are concerned about how it's being done was essential to the effort uh, in, in, in the education. We had an open willingness to openly consider. And I think by that transparency and that desire to, if we had to shift something slightly, we could. Uh, if we had to make some adjustments, we could. So we weren't locked into a specific method. We just wanted an outcome. And I think that made a huge difference in what we were trying. Did you work with some of your partners um, it, from the get-go in terms of figuring out what all you wanted to go into your burn plan? Did you have a model that you were working off of, or were you kind of, uh, or were you inventing the wheel? No, we had uh, Shan Kamek, who who is one of the burn uh, bosses for the state of Georgia uh, with the DNR non-game unit. Uh, she really provided some foundational information for us, some real great help on how we could approach things and what we could do. To, uh, to set things up. She showed us some model burn plans that we could adopt, and then we moved forward from there. And we also had hired a, uh, a contract, a, uh, a consulting forester. This made the county a whole lot more comfortable by having a consulting forester as the burn boss than 
as they lit the fire, that was the person responsible and had the, the insurance. So that was another avenue that we worked kind of a workaround of saying, hey, we've got this, this consultant who's coming in who's going to take responsibility for what happens on the ground. We then put the team around all of that so that there was this holistic approach to the, to the fire as a unit and as a group. And I think that also made a big difference, especially with our risk managers, as they, they were a little bit more relieved when we had insurance for it. Uh -huh. And I, I will believe say that. Has, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, would, I will say Georgia has some fantastic prescribed burn laws. Um, mm -hmm. It's really got that as an example, so it's a little bit easier for us than maybe other states. In Georgia, as long as you have a burn plan, a get approval from GFC, our Georgia Forestry Commission, you have a reasonable expectation that the fire is out and you have the obvious expertise and training, then if it jumps the fire line at some point, it's not necessarily the landowners, it's not necessarily your problem. Doesn't mean you don't have to put it out, but it, it does mean from a risk standpoint there's a, a significant reduction. Yeah, Georgia is a, um, as I understand, it's a, it's a gross negligence state. And um, the Georgia Prescribed Fire Council meeting uh, in Tifton a uh, month or so ago, there was a great uh, speaker who really went through the Georgia Prescribed Fire Law and, and, and talked about covers and some limitations. Um, and I see that Faith does have a question right here about it. Did you complete any studies after the prescribed fire to see what the benefit may be to wildlife? And we haven't, um, the, we just burned in February of this past year, so it's a little over eight months since we've done it. So we haven't actually had students out on the ground to do a scientific-based study. From anecdotally of our experience of staff and volunteers and people coming out, we can, and we haven't thinned yet, which will make a, a significant difference in that biodiversity. But we can say just anecdotally, we have seen more species. Uh, we've seen hawks hunting through the, through the forest that we didn't see before. We've seen more numbers of uh, wildlife. We, it's almost daily you see deer, which is exciting for the visitors <laughs> to see these big, uh, these big wildlife. So we have seen, anecdotally, we have seen a significant increase, at least in visibility of wildlife. So mm -hmm. we feel like, uh, and we certainly have seen more creepy crawly stuff uh, out there <laughs> than we've seen before. Uh, it's much more visible. So is the question, is it more visible or was it more species? I think that from the research, it should be more species, and we feel like we're seeing that. But I can't tell you scientifically that's the case. Mm -hmm. We had a, another question that came in from Claire, and she was asking, um, you know, how did economics come into this? You know, were there questions along the way about the economic costs of, of using fire versus other tools in here? We, um, we didn't do a, a great deal of investigation as far as balancing out, could we do it cheaper one way or the other. Uh, we felt like we wanted to demonstrate fire as a tool. Probably the toughest thing we had is going through the uh, approval process for the contracts with our harvester, simply because unlike what 99.9% .9 of what government does, uh, this was a situation we were hiring somebody to pay us to do certain things instead of us actually hiring and paying someone. Uh, that was a, a little bit different concept for, for folks to kind of work around. And since a lot of uh, the way it works is you might uh, – with, depending on what the techniques are that you're using, you just might not make as much money. So that really, the, the economics weren't as strong a factor in what we looked at. We are running around, um, if we estimate that with everything, including replanting, at the end of the day, of course, we're using volunteer labor and, and, and significant amount of help that way. Excluding our full-time people is going to run us somewhere around $250 to $300 an acre to clear and manage is what we think our end result will be uh, out of that. And you know the, the benefits, though, are pretty significant. And we think those annual costs will go down rather dramatically. The biggest expense we had, and we didn't count our, our full-time staff in that number, the biggest expense we have is, is getting those invasives out of there. If you don't have a nature center like we do, if you have a fairly strict, you know, typical forest operation, you're not worried about it. You do a, a winter foliage spray over and you're done, and you're not worried about it. We couldn't quite do that, so we, we feel like we had some expenses that were in there that m most operations wouldn't encounter. So, so it sounds like this is just the first step. 
in a long-term project, and, and it sounds like, too, that you're looking at expanding this potentially to other, other units or other properties. Um, is there anything that, that you would want to share that, that you'd do differently next time? Well, one thing I will mention is um, we we encountered through this process there was a lot of hesitancy or it, throughout the years of doing such a project, which is why I encourage people to, to start small. We felt like by having this demonstration fully accessible, we are American Tree Farm uh, System certified as a forest. By doing all of those steps and including all those partners, we begin to build up the trust and and the vision for how we can manage other properties. So we see this as a stepping stone to a, a bigger process along the way. I think the biggest thing that, that that I had to adjust to personally, it takes a lot of work to keep the coalition and keep the communication going. Uh, it also takes time. And if you go in thinking you can do it in a year, uh, we went in thinking we could do it a lot faster. And I'm glad we didn't. We had some weather issues. We had some uh, logistics issues. And at the end of the day, it's, we're spreading this out over probably twice as long as I anticipated at the beginning. And I'm really happy we did, because we've been able to take very deliberate steps, each one building on the next, not sweating, not getting in, uh, stressed out about it. And I think that's made a big difference, too. We can build the coalition from one step to the next, build the, the communication from one step to the next. And I would encourage people just to take that approach. Don't worry about how fast. Just do it slow, steady, and right. Mm -hmm. that, that feeds into Josh has a question he just posted. And, and uh, he says, I may have missed this earlier, but did you have any interaction uh, with the broader general public before you launched that burn? And then Absolutely. he follows that with, were they, were they mostly approving of the effort? And I'll add, too, you know, for the folks uh, who were maybe counter to this project, what were their arguments? Well, the interesting thing for us is we, since we approached it straight up, and it was more of an uh, intellectual exercise because it took us several months to, to act before introducing the idea to the actual burn, I think that played a role in it. Because we, we put it out on social media. We put it out on, uh, we wrote articles. We had uh, interviews that were going on. We made it perfectly clear from beginning uh, inception when we uh, went for approval all the way, which is very public. We have two very public meetings when you get something approved through our local agent, uh, governing body. When All the way along the line, we kept telling people this is coming. And we really didn't we got some people who were a little concerned but they were going well we're not sure that's a good idea but you sound like you believe it so maybe okay let's see <laughs> which was great i mean that's all we could ask and no pressure from our standpoint if they didn't like it at the end uh -huh. but it really did turn out because i think there was a transparency a willingness to embrace a willingness to discuss and consider, and when people gave us some alternatives, and one of the great things in Athens is, I tell people, a beautiful thing about Athens is you have an expert behind every tree, and one of the downsides of being in Athens is you have an expert <laughs> behind every tree. But it, that by engaging with all the different possibilities and, and ideas through this process, it really gave people a chance to give us some, some good feedback and thoughts, which we did adjust on a few things. And it also made them feel included, so we invited them out. We said, come on, uh, you know, be part of the team. Help us work through this. And I think that openness was a critical part of catching the, the public's attention. I won't say that there wouldn't be people that complained or we didn't hear them complain. Uh, there, there very, very well may have been, but it didn't come to our attention. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered if for a site like yours where it's, it's a essentially a park where you have a lot of uh, visitation. I wonder, are ticks an issue in there? Because there's some really compelling research that shows how effective prescribed fire can be in reducing tick populations. And uh, I always wondered for a project kind of like you're talking about here, if, if that would be a great pitch for folks who are on the fence about prescribed <laughs> fire. Because there's not too many people who are on the fence about ticks. No, they're not, and and you're absolutely <laughs> right. And I think anywhere, anytime you walk in a southern forest, the word that's kind of synonymous with with going home, synonymous with going home and checking yourself because you uh -huh. won't find ticks no matter what. 
just about anywhere you walk, once you step off a path, and sometimes even if you don't. Uh, so yes, uh, the, we, we have seen, there's a lot of different things that have come up, and that was one other thing that was very, very helpful. Uh, talking about invasive species and what happens to the pH in the soil, what happens to the, the invasive worms versus native worms when we move invasives off the site. Looking at the re recycling of, uh, of material, those kind of things. Um, uh, when we talked about microstegium and some of the, the impacts it has on reptiles and amphibians, any of those studies, the more you have at your fingertips, what it does is awaken people to the to the intricate nature of the interaction of a forest ecosystem. And I think that really makes people stop and go, you know, thoughtful people sit back and go, well, wow, this is really more than I thought. Ticks is another great example of that same thing. When people see that, that interaction between fire and fire uh, environments, then it, it, it becomes uh, important to them personally. And of course, from a wildfire standpoint, by reducing the fuel, protecting your site, and talking about not only do you increase habitat and, and biodiversity, but you also protect your site against the, the damages of uncontrolled fire. Right. That has really resonated well. Justice talk, which we didn't get to see, really talks well about that. Uh, he had a wonderful uh, discussion on how that really benefits your community just from that standpoint. I wish we could have seen it, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Well, speaking of Justice's presentation, we, um, we're we going to reschedule his because we, we don't want to miss it. We're really looking forward to, to uh, seeing his presentation today and sharing it with that with everybody. Uh, so we'll get the, the technology figured out uh, and get all those audio issues lined up. And, uh, and we're going to reschedule his to a later date. And we'll let everybody know. Uh, everybody that's with us here today is, has, has registered. So we have your contact information. We'll send out an email uh, once the recording of this webinar has been posted online. And we'll also uh, send you an email and let you know uh, once we have Justice's presentation uh, scheduled and, and lined up and ready to go. So uh, Mike, it looks like we have time for just one more question. And I want to let you respond to, we have a couple folks who, who mentioned uh, the ICS system. And uh, I wasn't 100% clear, did, do you use ICS to run this burn? And uh, do, do you think you'll plan to use that as, as a framework for your future burns? Uh, we we used the, the outline of that system uh, to run the burn. I had actually gone through wildland firefighter training and pulled that in to the operation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as formal as I think we need to make it. So that was probably the biggest gap uh, on the from the back end of the planning set system is really kind of using that as uh, much more formally in our train in our uh, structure of how we we get ready to go for the fire. Uh, I encourage anybody who's interested to go take a look at it. There's some free online training you can get. Uh, it's really a great opportunity to learn about it, and it provides a wonderful foundation and absolutely is something we will be incorporating and continue to incorporate into our effort. Very good. All right. Well, if you guys have any other questions for uh, Mike or Justice, I know Justice, uh, we didn't get to see his presentation. We'll see that again in the future. But if you have questions for Mike or, or Justice uh, or myself or Holly Campbell, our contact information is there on the screen. Uh, we do have a survey. Uh, we hope that you'll take just a couple of minutes uh, to click on that. Uh, we'll also be launching that when we close out the webinar window in just a minute. Uh, that'll let you know and let our speakers know today uh, what you thought about the presentations and how all of us can, can tether our future webinars to meet your, your prescribed fire and your fire management needs. So it does look like we've run up to the end of our time. Uh, we said the webinar has been recorded and then we'll have it on our YouTube page uh, and shortly, once we get that edited and uploaded. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Justice. And thanks, Holly. And for our sponsors and for, for a great presentation this afternoon. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.